Good morning. Actually, no, good afternoon. 10 past 12. Good afternoon. Welcome to 55 new features in JDK 9. I must admit, I'm actually quite impressed to see so many people here. Uh, the reason being that there have been three JDK 9 talks in a row. There was Joe Darcy, then there was Trisha, and now there's me. So you get to hear about JDK 9 from a slightly different perspective. Now, obviously, JDK 9 is, let me see, about three, no, it's about four months away from when it's going to be released. And I say that with confidence that July the 27th is when JDK 9 will be released. Um, it is now feature complete, sort of. Um, there's still some work going on in the area of Jigsaw, but from the point of view of the rest of the features, Everything is actually in there, and they're now on the ramp down phase in terms of only fixing critical bugs that will affect, affect the, the next release. Now, what I've done is to go through 55 new features in JDK 9, which means we need to move at a reasonable pace. And the first section that I've created for this is major features, things which are significant in terms of changes. Obviously, the biggest of those is modularity in Jigsaw. Now, I'm not going to spend too long talking about Jigsaw because I want to talk about lots of other features as well. But it is worth mentioning a few of the things which are happening from the point of view of modularity and the way that Jigsaw has been implemented. First of those is that the standard class libraries that we use in Java are changing from the point of view of how they are delivered to you in the JDK. Up until now, we have a single jar file, rt.jar, which contains all of the class libraries we can use, something like 4,500 in JDK 8. Those have been broken up into a series of modules. And if you look in the jmods directory of the JDK, you will find there are 94 modules currently. Um, it has changed a little bit over time, but there are now 94 modules in the jmods directory. One of the big things in terms of how Jigsaw is working and the effect that it may have on your code are that the private APIs, which you were never supposed to use from rt.jar, the ones that were there to make the public APIs work, most of those have been encapsulated. That means that they're now no longer accessible to your code. As I say, you were never supposed to use them. They were never publicly documented. They were never publicly supported. Lots of people, however, have used them. And if you look at things like libraries, if you look at things like frameworks, frequently they have made use of things like Sun Misc Unsafe in order to improve the efficiency and the performance of some of their code. Things have been done to try and alleviate the problems of portability and backwards compatibility. So right now, there are a couple of command line options which you can use to turn on the ability to still access some of those APIs. So things like Sun Misc Unsafe, um, Cleaner, a couple of the reflection ones. These can be accessible if you add the minus minus add exports, if you want to import them into your, your code, if you want them accessible from the module, or minus minus adds, add opens. This is if you want to access them through reflection. So you've got two command line options that will turn on the encapsulated uh, critical APIs. Also, the source code for the JDK has been made more modular. And so now the idea of using modules in the JDK means that the source code has been reorganized to support that module system. This in itself is not the module system. It's just that the JDK uh, modules obviously have to have source code associated with them, and therefore the modules are built from that. I'm um, just going to say a little bit more about modularity in Jigsaw because this is such a big thing in terms of the feature. Compatibility is an issue. It's something which, as I say, the fact that the internal APIs, the private APIs, are being encapsulated is going to have an impact on some code. Now, you may not have used Sun Misc Unsafe, you may not have used any of the internal APIs, but most likely you are using libraries, you are using frameworks, and as I say, many of those have used these things. There are ways of overriding the encapsulation I already mentioned, but 
Um, one of the big things that was announced just literally yesterday was what has been called the big kill switch, which is sounds, sounds quite dangerous, really. But what it actually means is that you can effectively turn off modularity. You can say, right, modularity is going to interfere with my application code. I need it to keep working in JDK 9. So if you set the minus minus permit illegal access, it will turn off the modularity system underneath from the point of view of accessing these APIs. The other thing you can do if you are concerned about backwards compatibility, you can take your application and you can simply leave all of your classes, all of your JAR files on the class path. You can ignore the module path and you can simply keep everything on the class path and you can run your application just as it was run before. So that will, will maintain backwards compatibility with existing applications. And hopefully with the introduction of the big kill switch, this will make things easier because there have been a number of things that have been discussed on the mailing list that have caused problems, even with the ability to override some of the accessibility to the encapsulated APIs. JLink is another feature related to modularity. And what this allows you to do is to build a runtime which only contains the modules that you need for your application. It's like a stripped down version of the runtime for a given application. What you do is you take your module that contains your application. From that, the compiler will be able to build a module dependency graph, and it will know what modules your application actually requires. And then it can build a directory structure which looks very much like the JDK with the JRE in it. You will find a bin directory, you will find a conf directory, you will find a jmods directory, you will find a lib directory. If you want to create something like that, you can do something like jlink minus module path, jmods, add modules, and in this case, we're just going to add one, which is java.base, which means that this particular runtime will be of no real use since you can't do anything, um, and you output it to a directory. Great. If you then run the Java executable within that directory structure and you say list mods, what you'll get back is Java base saying that's the only module that is available in this runtime. If we were to do this for a more realistic example where we've got some kind of application which depends on a number of modules and we do the same thing and we list out the modules, you will see Java base, Java logging, Java SQL, Java XML, commas all app, zoop, zeta. So all the modules you need, but none of the ones you don't. So there's no Corba there, there's no desktop there. Um, anything else is left out. The observant amongst you will also notice that there's a little bit of extra information there at 9.0, at 1.0. And you may be getting excited. You may be thinking to yourself, oh, look, we have versioning in the module system. Do not be excited. Do not get excited about this at all, because that is there simply for information purposes. And I actually put a quote here from the, the documentation, the state of the module system, and it says it is not a goal of the module system to solve the version selection problem. So don't get excited about using versioning in your application code. And in fact, the designers of the module system really don't like versioning to the point that at the moment, the, the way that module system is defined is if you try and sneak in versioning by calling the jar file that you put your module in, say foo-1.0 or foo-2.0, what they're going to do is they're going to strip off the number at the end so that you can't sneak in versioning that way. Now, whether that actually gets through to the end of the, the development phase is a little bit debatable at the moment because, of course, there are some uh, libraries and packages which use numbers at the end which aren't versioning. So, um, you know, there, there's all sorts of examples of this that people have come up with. And so it's quite likely that that is going to change before the final release, but we'll wait and see. Next thing, factory methods for collections. So one of the things that is often the kind of thing that we want to do is to create a collection and to be able to provide a set of values when we create the collection. And up until now, it's been quite complicated. And in fact, if you look at an example here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna to have to create a set, which in this case is gonna be a hash set. 
we then have to add each element individually, A, B, C, and then if we want it to be an immutable, unmodifiable set, we then have to call a method on the collection to say, use this, or in fact, we call the collections utility method, unmodifiable set, pass in set, and get back an unmodifiable one. So that's, you know, a lot of boilerplate code and is, is not very um, clean, really. So what JDK9 does is introduce a new set of methods which allow you to do things like this. So set string set equals set dot of ABC. One line of code rather than five. Now, the way this has been implemented is that there are 11, actually there's 12 methods that have been added to the list, the set, and the, uh, the map class, uh, interface, sorry. And so there are versions that are overloaded which are from zero to 10 elements. So there's a, a specific method which takes three arguments. There's a specific method that takes four, five, six, and so on. But there's also one which takes var args. Now, the reasoning for this is that in order to make the, the code more efficient, it's easier to have a set of overloaded methods which take a variable a number of arguments or a specific number of arguments. But then once you go beyond 10, you can use the var args version of it. And so you can provide an arbitrary number of values to the, the particular method. Stream enhancements. Streams were obviously one of the big features in JDK 8, very popular from the point of view of providing a more functional style of programming. Few things have been added to this. Um, there's a couple of new methods, drop while and take while. These are quite similar in structure to the way that the skip and limit methods work at the moment. Skip and limit allow you to, as the name would suggest, skip a certain number of elements on the input stream before you start taking them and processing them. But the way you do that is by specifying a number. So you have to have an absolute value associated with that. Limit is the opposite of that, where you say, I only want to take the first n elements of the input stream, and then I want to drop the rest of them. Again, an absolute value. Drop while and take while do effectively the same thing in that they will either take a certain number of elements from the input stream and then stop, or they will ignore a certain number of elements from the input stream before starting. But the way that that is done is rather than using an absolute value, it uses a predicate. So you can have a condition associated with that and say, I want to drop while this condition is false. Once it becomes true, then I start taking elements. One thing I would say about that is that you do need to be a little bit careful because if you have an unordered stream, you could get a situation where you say, take while certain condition is false. Once it turns true, I stop taking elements from the input stream. But if it's an unordered stream, you may well get elements in the input stream that would have satisfied that criteria after the, the stream stops taking input elements. So just be aware of that. Using a, an ordered stream will eliminate that problem. The iterate method has been improved. So there is now an, an iterate method which looks a lot like the for loop. So you have an initial value, you have a condition associated with when that iterate is going to stop, and then you have a third argument. This is what's been added, a third argument which allows you to say what happens on each iteration of that iterate. So it looks like the existing for loop from the point of view of the, the structure of it. The file, files.lines has been included now, which is a way of having parallel access to a, the lines of a file. What this means is that if previously, if you tried to have something like a buffered reader attached to a file, and read the information from that, processing it as a parallel stream, it would run very, very badly because clearly it's a sequential stream of strings being read from the file. You're trying to process it in parallel. They don't match. There's a, a real impedance mismatch there. Files.lines, memory maps your file into memory and then divides it up based on line breaks and tries to separate it out in terms of, you know, uh, however many threads you want in terms of the parallel processing. That way you can have each thread being able to access strings from the, the, or the lines from the file 
independently and therefore you can get a benefit from parallel processing rather than sequential processing. Optional now has a new method and it allows you to get a stream from an optional. It might seem a little bit strange, but essentially what you're going to get is a stream of zero or one elements, depending on whether there's a null or a value associated with that optional. Multi-release jar files. Um, this is the idea that you can have several, <laughs> having said that the, the designers of Jigsaw don't like versioning, what they're actually going to allow you to do is put multiple versions of a specific class file in a single jar file. And the idea is that the version will be associated with the version of the, the runtime. So you will have a JDK 9 version of your class, you'll have a JDK 10 version of your class, JDK 11 version of your class. You'll notice I didn't mention JDK 8 or earlier. So this only starts at JDK 9. So right now, a multi-release jar file can only support one release, which is JDK 9. When we get to JDK 10, you'll be able to support two releases, and so on and so forth. But right now, it's a single multi-release jar file, which is kind of strange. But anyway, that, that, you have to start somewhere, I guess. That's the point. So a few changes that have been made in terms of the way that works. So the class loaders have been updated to support the idea of multi-release jar files. The jar file API itself has also been adapted to support this. And the relevant tools, things like Java C, Java P, JDEPS, and so on, have been adapted. REPL. JShell, um, again, this is a fairly major feature. What we've got here is the idea of a read, eval, print loop. This allows you to do simple prototyping. I must admit, when I first saw this, I sort of thought to myself, oh, OK, it's kind of like a novel feature, but I'm not sure how much I'll use it. And then you actually start writing code, and you think to yourself, ooh, wouldn't it be good if I could just test this little bit of code without having to like, run it through the whole compile and the compiler thing? And so you go to JShell, and you, you type in your code, and you go, ooh, actually, that's really good, because now I can test what's actually happening with my code. And then I go back to the IDE, and now I understand what's happening in a clearer way, and I can test things. So it is actually, I find, a, a really useful thing. And of course, you can tell how old I am, because green on black. So it's, it's kind of a comfortable feeling for me because it's more like a, a VT100 terminal. Concurrency updates. Um, a couple of things that have been changed here. One of the, the really sort of substantial things is that there's now a more reactive way of doing streams. So there's a publish subscribe framework. This is all around the idea of having asynchronous non-blocking support in the same way that you've got RxJava. Um, and other sort of reactive frameworks that have proven to be very popular at the moment. This is all based on the idea of a flow. So there's a, a flow class, and then associated with that, you've got publishers, subscribers, processors, and a subscription. And the idea is you can have a submission publisher utility class. So you can say, right, I want to have a subscriber to a set of messages from a publisher, and then you'll get the, the various messages being passed back and forth. That will happen in an asynchronous way to the current subscribers, and you have to implement the flow.processor. So there's, there's, it's a reasonably simple way of doing it, and it's a nice clean API for that. Concurrency updates, again, so, um, from the point of view of completable future. Completable future was introduced in JDK 8, um, this has now been kind of extended a bit to add some new features, things like the idea of delays and timeouts. Um, there's also better support for the idea of subclassing, the completable future. There are a number of situations where people want to be able to do that. And there are some new um, utility methods. There's things like a minimal completion stage. There's a failed stage. And two that I particularly liked, which was the idea of a new incomplete future and a failed future. So there you go. You can have a failed future. Enhanced deprecation. So deprecation has been around for a long time, right back to JDK 1.1, when the at deprecated Java doc tag was introduced. And then in JDK 5, the at deprecated annotation was added to allow certain elements of the API to be marked as no longer being required, and at some point in the future, they may be removed. Now, if you look at the number of elements that have been marked as deprecated, there's literally hundreds of them. There's, there's something like 300 methods that have been deprecated in the standard Java API. 
up until now, absolutely none of them have ever been removed, which is great for backwards compatibility, but is not really ideal from the point of view of evolving an API in a clean way. In JDK 9, as part of the modularity changes, six particular methods will be removed that have been deprecated in the past. So that's six public APIs that have been deprecated in the past are being removed in JDK 9. Um, that's all to do with the ability to be able to separate out the, the runtime libraries into the specific modules. But deprecation itself is being updated. So having the deprecated tag, having the deprecated annotation was problematic because there were too many situations that that tried to cover without providing enough detail about what was actually happening. So now, if you look at the deprecated annotation, there are two new methods that are being added to that. One is the for removal method, which returns a Boolean, true or false. And what that says is, will this particular element ever be removed? Because there are certain situations where you want to say, well, there is a better way of doing this, but we don't want to remove it because it still makes sense to leave it in the API. Other ones are in the situation where, yes, they really do need to be removed at some point. So by marking them for removal, the idea is if that comes back true, it will potentially be removed in the next release. That's the, the goal is to move them in, remove them in the next release. Associated with that, there's also a new method called since, which returns a string. And what that will do is will return you the version when that particular element was deprecated. So you will see you know, version 8, version 9, version 10, and so on. Um, a number of deprecated tags have been added to various methods and so on in the API. But interestingly, two methods have been given a reprieve. So they've had the deprecated tag removed. So if you look at java.awt.component, there are show and hide methods there. They were deprecated. In JDK 9, they are no longer deprecated. They've been brought back from the dead, as it were. And then there's also a very useful new command called jdeprascan, which will analyze your code. And it will look through, you basically give it a jar file, or you can give it the source code, and it will look through it, and it will tell you where you have used deprecated methods. So it'll give you a report on what you might need to change. Milling Project Coin. So Project Coin was back in JDK 7, and that was the idea of adding a number of small language features, things like the diamond operator, things like strings in switch statement, and the try with resources uh, way of doing things. Things that are changing there are some, again, very small changes to improve the language a little bit. One of those is that a single underscore is no longer going to be valid as an identifier. So hands up, anybody who's used a single underscore as a variable name. I see nobody. That's good. Well, the good news is that if you really do want to use a single underscore as a variable name, you can actually just make it a double underscore. And that's still valid because I tried it, and it will work. Um, not because I was actually writing code where I wanted to use an underscore as a variable name. But anyway, uh, the reason for this is so that under, the single underscore can be reused in the future to indicate situations where you have a variable which is a parameter that's not going to be used. So a good example of that is if you have a lambda expression with a single parameter which is not used in the body of the lambda expression, by using the underbar, you can then make the, the syntax potentially simpler and, and uh, just kind of make it more readable in that sense. Private methods in interfaces. Because JDK 8 introduced the idea of default methods and static methods being supported in interfaces, essentially adding multiple inheritance of behavior as well as multiple inheritance of, of um, types, it now makes sense to also add private methods. You can have a private static method or you can have a private instance method. And so what that will allow you to do is to have um, helper methods associated with the default methods or the static methods in that particular interface. Try with resources is being changed slightly so that now rather than having to declare the, the definition of the variables that you want to use within the try block, you can actually access variables from outside of the try block, but they must be either explicitly marked final or effectively final. So they, they behave as if they're final. You can then reference those within your try 
finally block and the, the code will actually take care of ensuring that the, um, the finally clause is called. And so you can do things like closing uh, files or um, terminating things as you need to. Safe varogs on private instance methods. Uh, this is just, a, again, a fairly minor change which relates to the fact that safe varogs um, simplifies the way some of the things work from the point of view of eliminating some error messages, well, warning messages that you get, which actually don't really need to be um, provided to you because it's a, a safe situation. So now, in addition to constructors being able to have safe varags associated with them, final methods and static methods, private methods will also be able to marked, be marked with the at safe varags annotation. The diamond operator with anonymous classes is also being extended slightly to use type inference in a better way. And the reason for this is that if you look at um, the, the way things work with the diamond operator. This is to do with generics, so you use the diamond operator where you don't have to specify the generic type explicitly. If you look at um, generic types and anonymous classes, they don't quite work together in the way they should in JDK 8 and earlier. I mean, when I say they don't quite work the way they should, in, in terms of the compilation. So now, by allowing the type inference to work in a slightly better way, it means you can use the diamond operator when you're using an anonymous class. S next big section is updates in terms of standards, because it's obviously always useful to make sure that we are supporting the latest version of uh, the standards that are relevant. So the first of these is Unicode. So we have Unicode 7 and Unicode 8 that have been provided since JDK 8 was, was launched. And if you look at J Unicode 7, there are 2,834 new characters. I looked at that and I thought, really? 2,800 characters they managed to find? So if you look at that in a little bit more detail, what you find is that there are mostly emojis that have been added to Unicode 7. Uh, funnily enough, there's also the ruble currency symbol and the currency symbol for Azerbaijan. So just as a small piece of information. And then in, G in Unicode 8, we added another 7,700 characters. And you go, how is that possible? If you added you know, three, nearly 3,000 in Unicode 7, how did you find another 8,000 for Unicode 8? And the answer is, again, a lot more emojis. But also, interestingly, they added support for Cherokee in lowercase. Already had Cherokee in uppercase, they added Cherokee in lowercase. So, great, okay, that's, that's the way it works. So now you can do that. Uh, also, in terms of some security stuff, so there's update in terms of the, the way that the key stores work. So now it's public key store cryptography um, is 12, is being used by default rather than the Java cryptography, uh, Java key store, sorry. HTML5 Java docs, so making the Java docs a little bit prettier, keeping things up to date, and also moving to the SHA3 hash algorithm, so trying to keep ahead of the, uh, the hackers. A few other smaller features. Um, now, property files can use UTF-8, and what this means is that you can use Unicode for your property files. That means that now, because we support Unicode 8, you can use lowercase Cherokee in your property file. So you no longer have to shout in Cherokee. Resource bundle API had to be updated to deal with that. Um, then there's this thing called DRBG based secure random implementations. DRBG is a deterministic random bit generator. I must admit I looked at that and I thought, isn't that an oxymoron, a deterministic random bit generator? I don't know, but anyway, we now support that. And then the XML catalog API, which is a way of supporting some of the, the metadata to do with um, when you're processing XML. So now there's a, a support for the Oasis XML catalog API version 1.1, and that works with the Java API for XML parsing. Things that have changed inside the JVM. Next big section. So the first of these is that the default collector is changing in JDK 9. So this is something that you definitely need to be aware of if garbage collection and the way that works is important to you. Right now, if you're using a server class machine, which uh, dates back a few years, and so it's a dual 
processor, two gigabytes of memory or more, you'll be using the parallel collector. Because most people like low pause collection, it's now going to be G1 as the default collector. G1's been around for a while, so it's fairly mature. It works very well, it's production ready, and as I say, it's a low pause collector. A few things were also added in terms of JDK 8, some of the updates that improved the way that G1 worked. Things like the ability to have concurrent class loading was added. However, having said that, I work for Azul, so you get a very brief sales pitch here, which is that the G1 collector falls back to a full compacting collection if it can't keep up with the rate of allocation and the rate that garbage is being generated. That means you will still get significant pauses in your application code. So if you don't want those, you can always try Zing. Zing is a pauseless garbage collector. We have solved the problem of garbage collection. So if you're interested in that, uh, happy to talk to you more about that afterwards. Better string performance. Strings we use a lot in Java. And so any way that we can improve the performance of how strings are handled will be an improvement on a lot of application code. Compact strings is one of the things that have been, uh, has been introduced in JDK 9. Now, what that is about is not compacting, um, like not using alternative encodings to, to compress the strings in a different way, but it's really just making the way that the space is used in the string class more efficient. It's a, it's a fairly sort of small uh, or low level feature that you won't really see anything, uh, any great benefit from unless you're using a lot of strings and, and doing a lot of string processing. The other thing is um, the idea of using the, um, what's called the CDS archive, which is the common something or other um, way of storing things. So this enables you to share strings between different JVMs. So you can actually have multiple JVMs and rather than having to have copies of strings in all the heaps of those, those JVMs, you can have one copy and it's actually shared between them. So it's better if you're running multiple JVMs. The, the way string concatenation worked has also been modified. So now it's using the invoke, uh, well, it's actually using the, um, it, it's, uh, the way that it works internally is being changed so that you've got a different way of doing the, the bytecode sequence. And it's using the invoke dynamic bytecode so that it can shift the implementation away from the compile time code to when the code is actually run on the JVM. And that gives the ability to have not just a slight improvement in performance now, but it also allows for changes to the way the JVM handles string concatenation in the future without having to recompile your code. Uh, another feature that has been added is the graphics render, renderer. So if you're using graphics in your system, then at the moment there is an open source implementation that's part of the OpenJDK, that's called Pisces. If you get the binary from Oracle, they actually replace that with a closed source version called Ductus, and that gives much better performance. To address that, there is now the thing, uh, graphics renderer called Marlin, which gives pretty much the same performance as the Ductus one, but is open source. And this graph here, which looks very complicated, is essentially measuring the impact of the graphics renderer on application code. The green line is where you, you can see the, um, the Pisces renderer. So essentially what you're seeing there is um, greater latency associated with that. Whereas the blue and the red, which are pretty much on top of each other, are the Ductus and the Marlin graphics renderer. So they're, they're fairly similar in terms of performance. Some smaller features, um, improvements to contended locking. So what this does now is, again, internally, it does some different things in terms of field reordering. It does some different things in terms of the way that the cache lines are used, so that when you have got a situation where you've got multiple threads all trying to access the same lock, things will work in a slightly more um, performant way. Re um, leveraging CPU instructions for certain hashing algorithms and encryption algorithms. A lot of processors now have the ability to support hardware of uh, hardware acceleration of this. So now that's going to be used directly from the JVM. This gives quite a lot of speed up. You can see in certain tests of these things, then you get a, a speed up of somewhere between 34 and 150 times what you had before. JavaFX, for those of you using it, that's been upgraded in terms of GStreamer. So that's the way of um, rendering uh, video 
to the screen. So there's a new version of that, which updated. That's replica or used in terms of the media class, gives you better security, better stability, and as I say, better performance. A uh, couple of other smaller features in terms of the JVM. Um, you've now got a segmented code cache. So what this does is, again, just reorganizing things internally in the JVM and how it caches the code that's used where you've done adaptive compilation of particular methods. So you've got separate non-method profiled and non-profiled code. Logging. Logging has been um, unified in the JVM. So rather than having lots of di different ways of doing logging for different parts of the system, there's now a common way of doing that for all components of the JVM. And related to that is the idea of GC logging. So GC logging now uses the unified logging to give you the, the messages that you need in terms of how your garbage collector is working. Specialized changes to JDK 9. So one of these is a, is a very small change. It's called spin weight hints. And as Azul, we're, we're very um, proud of this because we proposed this as a JDK enhancement proposal. And so, as I say, we rock. Um, the idea of this is to help with performance. We're all always very concerned in terms of making sure that the JVM performs as well as possible. And what we wanted to do is prove that the JEP idea works for companies outside of Oracle. Not many people have actually proposed JEPs who are not part of Oracle. We're one of them, and this is the first one that's actually been accepted and integrated into the JDK. It is a very small change, but potentially with huge impact because it changes or adds a method to the thread class. Since thread class is used a lot in Java, we need to make sure that any changes made to that are very carefully controlled and reviewed very carefully. So we're adding one method on spin weight to the thread class. What this allows you to do is to tell the JVM where you think that the processor might be spinning in order to wait for a particular situation to happen. There are certain things that can happen in terms of the hardware underneath where rather than actually spinning the processor, it will actually, in effect, pause the processor. The advantage of that is that it gives you better power consumption, and it also means that you'll wake up slightly faster. So it's, it's again, very low level feature, but potentially can be useful, especially if you're in a big data center and you've got a lot of this going on, it will potentially save you um, heat and energy. Variable handles. So this is um, working towards a replacement for Sun Misc Unsafe. Sun Misc Unsafe is still accessible in JDK 9, but the idea is it's going away. So it will be encapsulated in JDK 10. You won't be able to access it anymore. Obviously, because people have used it, a public API needs to be made available, which gives people the same functionality, but in a documented and supported way. Variable handles are part of that. And what variable handles allow you to do is to take some of the instance variables you have associated with a particular method, particular class, and then you can put a fence around them from the point of view of memory access. You can treat them, in essence, as if they are, if, if you have several operations, you can treat them as an atomic operation without having to put them inside or use an atomic class instance. So there's already the atomic class as part of the concurrency utilities, but that's obviously a lot heavier weight because you have to create an instance of that class and then you have to use your instance variables with it. Now, what you'll be able to do is say, right, I just want to fence around this set of operations and the, the JVM and therefore the CPU will treat them as if they are a, an atomic operation. There are various things that you can use with a variable handle. So there's compare and exchange, compare and set, as you would expect, get and add, get and set, acquire fence, release fence. So there's simple ways of, of actually using that. Enhanced method handles. So method handles have been around for a, a little while. They, uh, I think they were introduced in JDK 7. What this does is really just extend the, the way that you can use method handles. So now you've got support for the idea of a loop using method handles. You've also got support for the idea of try finally blocks using method handles. Different ways of doing um, argument handling so that you can do spreading, which is where you take a number of arguments. Uh, if you've got a, an array of arguments, you can actually spread them out into individual arguments. Collection, which is the opposite of that. You take the arguments and then you 
packaging them up into an array and folding, which is where you can sort of say, okay, I want this set of arguments from the whole set and doing things with, with that in, in ways that make sense. A few more lookup functions in terms of being able to access method handles. So now you have the idea of non-abstract methods in both interfaces and classes being able to have um, method handles associated with them. Some smaller features in respect to this. So compiler control is uh, now a way to do this. This is the JIT compiler, not the Java C compiler. So you can actually um, tell the JIT compiler certain things through the use of a directive file. So you can give it information about how you want it to, to deal with adaptive compilation when, it's, uh, when it starts up and when it's running. You can also inject those changes using the J command, command and you can say, right, I want to change something at runtime of how the compiler for the JIT works in respect of C1 and C2. A few changes around the process API. What this is intended to do is to provide you with more information about what's happening at the operating system. And the reason for that really is that operating systems now are very uh, common in terms of the way that they treat processes. So you have a, a common set of um, data that's associated with those things. So now you've got the idea of a native process, either as a process or a process handle. You've also got more information about those processes the process ID, the arguments that were provided to that process, the start time, the CPU usage, and the name. And then in terms of using that, obviously there is some control. Uh, so it depends on the security manager as to how much information you can actually get from the process itself. Housekeeping, things that have been changed in that respect. So new version string format this is this is a, a good idea but is also potentially something that might affect backwards compatibility if you rely on testing the version string associated with the java runtime you may have to change your code to take account of the the new way that this works the version string in java has always been a little bit confusing because you have this way of expressing things depending on whether you look at the jdk externally or jdk internally so we have, right now, you have JDK 8 update 121. Right, well, okay, that means we've got JDK 8 update 121. But also, if you look internally, you'll find it's actually JDK 1.8.0 underbar 1U121, which is, you know, okay, so why is it 1.8? Well, the answer to that is that back in JDK 1.2, or yes, JDK 1.2, that was when Java SE 2, Java 2 SE came about because they decided to rebrand Java with Java 2. So you had Java 2 version 1.2, and then you had Java 2 version 1.3, Java 2 version 1.4, um, and then they decided, okay, there was never going to be a Java 3, and so it would be Java 5. Okay, so <laughs> this is where marketing meets engineering, and it doesn't necessarily always work. So you've got this different problem of, of understanding the, the actual string and what numbers are involved, but also you've got this problem of the way that you have updates. So is JDK 7 update 55 or JDK 7 update 60, which has more patches? Well, logically you would say 60, but actually it's 55 just because of the way that it works. So now there is a new simpler way of doing things. There's gonna be JDK major, minor, security, and patch. So four different elements to the number, easy to understand by humans, easier to understand by code because you can parse it much more easily. And this is much more based on the idea of semantic versioning. The structure of the JDK and the JRE is changing. So if you look at JDK 8 and earlier, what you have is the JDK, and then below that you've got a bin directory. The bin directory has Java in it, it has Java C, it has Java H, and so on. It has a lib directory, which has a tools.jar file in it. And then you've got a JRE directory within the JDK. If you look in that, you've got a bin directory. Bin directory's got a Java in it, which means you've got two copies of Java. They may be a symbolic link, but there's still two copies of it. And you've got a lib directory with rt.jar in it. That's all changing in JDK 9. JDK 9 uses a flatter directory structure. Now you have JDK9, you have a bin directory with one copy of Java in it, Java C, Java H, and so on. You have a conf directory, which is where 
any of the files which you can potentially, as a user, change will be placed. Before, they were kind of distributed around, and it wasn't clear whether configuration files should be changed by you or whether they should be left alone. Now, anything in the conf directory is something that potentially you could change. And the lib directory is not going to have any jar files in it. Um, there's also a jmod file, a jmod directory, which has all the, the Java modules in it. The lib directory has any native code that's required for the particular JVM that you're running. No more JRE directory, no more tools.jar, no more rt.jar. A few smaller features, um, searchable API documentation. Oh, this is just the best thing. This is my favorite feature in JDK 9. The fact that finally you don't have to scroll all the way down the, the list of APIs in the Java docs to get to string, for example. You can just type it into the search bar. And, and it's only taken them, what, 22 years to get to this point? It's incredible. There we go. Um, annotations pipeline. Uh, so this is just the way that the, the annotations are processed internally. So you've got some complications in terms of having repeating annotations on types and, and the way it works with lambdas. So there's just a, a cleaner way of doing that. There's also a parser API for NAS Horn so that you can interact with that programmatically rather than just through the command line. General cleanup, um, disabling SHA-1 certificates, mostly. There's a few situations where they still are accepted, but the idea is to move away from them because they're an old standard which people don't want to use anymore. Deprecate the applet API. Anybody still using applets? I don't see anybody. OK, so that's not going to affect anybody. Um, deprecating the API, so unfortunately, tumbling duke will be no more. Things removed from JDK 9. So in addition to adding lots of new features, some things are being removed. I mentioned there were six APIs that had been deprecated before and were being removed from the public set of APIs. That's add and remove action listener that are in the PAC 200 and the log manager classes. As I say, the reason for those things being removed are because of the, uh, the need to be able to separate out code so that you can have distinct modules and not have the situation where when you have one module, it just depends on everything else in the JDK through these bizarre kind of connections. So this was pulling things apart. The ability to select a Java runtime version from the command line has gone away. So minus version, no longer accepted. And the demos and the samples that were included in the JDK haven't been maintained. They're out of date, so they're actually going away as well. A couple of other things that have been deleted. The JVM uh, tools interface, the HPROF agent, that is going away. It was only ever intended as a demonstration of JVM TI. Most of the features of that have been replaced by other tools. So if you look at things like JMAP, that will give you the similar functionality. The JHAT tool is going away. That was an experimental tool that was introduced in JDK 6. It's never been supported and there are much better heap visualization tools around that you can use instead. A number of GC options are being removed as well. So if you look at JDK 8, these were all deprecated, so you were given advanced warning. If you used them in JDK 8, you would have seen a warning saying these options will go away. Mostly it's about removing bizarre combinations which nobody really should be using anyway, and we don't want to be, have to test them. So things like somebody using a parallel new collector with a serial old collector. I mean, why would you possibly do that? So that's going away. Other things which are really going away is the idea of incremental concurrent mark sweep. So that's just not really necessary anymore, so it's going away. And some of the, the CMS foreground stuff as well. So the, those are disappearing as options. One thing I am going to just, uh, briefly talk about is the idea of incubator modules. And what this is, is allowing the development of the API in a way that things can be rolled out and let developers test them before they become part of the standard. The idea is to say, OK, here's, here's a module, because now we have modules in our, our system. Here's a module that contains a new API for, well, in the good example here, HTTP2. You can take that, you can use it, you can test it, you can see whether it works in the way that you expect it to, and you can give feedback to Oracle and the OpenJDK team. And then if they need to make changes, they can before it becomes part of the standard. 
rather than them just deciding this is how the API will work and then finding after it's part of the standard that developers don't like it and then having to try and deprecate things and change them, why not make it uh, so that you can try it before it becomes part of the standard? So that's the idea of incubator modules. Just to summarize, um, JDK 9, big new feature is modularity. As I said, there's a number of things around that in terms of backwards compatibility. The, the big kill switch will hopefully address some of those problems. There's a lot of smaller features as well, new APIs for streams, the reactive API, JShell, lots of things that I've talked about in terms of standards, performance, um, the, the way that things are working. One thing I would say is test your application with early access versions. See whether your application runs, see if there are any problems. The more time you have before it becomes the release, the more time you have to address those issues. Um, one thing I will say as well, again, my, my final sort of sales pitch, uh, we create a version of OpenJDK which we call Zulu. It's a binary distribution that we build from OpenJDK. We run the TCK on it, we make it freely available on the standard platforms, so Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, as I say, it's completely free. If you want, we will sell you a support package at a very reasonable price compared to other competitors in that space. Um, and we support older versions as well, so we support JDK 6, 7, and 8, and early access versions of 9. And we will take security fixes from JDK 8 when they're in OpenJDK, and we'll backport them 7 and 6, and then we will upstream those into the OpenJDK project as well. So talk to me if you've got any more interest in that. Um, so I think we probably have less than, so uh, it's lunchtime, so if anybody's got any questions, put your hand up. Done silence. Okay, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm.